the outcome, well, of course you prefer to win. There's no question about it. I mean, that's why the archer in the metaphor definitely wants to hit the target. It's not, a, it's not like he doesn't care about hitting the target. That is the whole point of archery, right? You want to hit the target. But he also comes into it from the start with the notion that if he has done his best and yet does not hit the target, it's okay. And it's okay because he has done his best. Massimo, you are a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. Well, you're currently on sabbatical, uh, but uh, usually you are a professor there. You are the author of a number of books, including The Field Guide to a Happy Life and my most recent read, which I have here, which is How to Be a Stoic. You also have a background in science, um, biology, I believe. So I think you are extremely qualified to answer um, the fundamental question that you seek to answer in how to be a stoic, which is how we ought to live our lives. And uh, I guess in this case today, how we ought to live our lives on the golf course. Um, <laughs> but before we get to that though, did I hear that you found stoicism thanks to a midlife crisis? Yeah, that's right. I discovered, or I should be, I should say rediscovered stoicism in the middle of a midlife crisis. Rediscovered because when I was growing up uh, in Rome, Italy, uh, in high school, I studied Latin and I translated Seneca, who is a Stoic. But I never actually thought of him as a Stoic philosopher. I just saw, thought of him as somebody I had to translate for, for a class. And then later in college, I read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, also a Stoic. But I never actually put the two together as talking about the same kind of stuff. You know, I, had, I guess I had other other priorities at the time. But then uh, about 20 plus years later, I was going to a, through a regular midlife crisis. You know, nothing uh, particularly unusual, but uh, the, in the same year I was hit by an unexpected divorce. Uh, my father died and uh, I, I found a, I got a new job, which meant moving across country uh, you know, buying a new house, etc. Now, any psychologist would tell you that one of those things happening uh, is stressful enough. If all of those happen in a period of like three or four months, uh, then you start saying, whoa, what the heck? What's going on here? And so now by that time, uh, as you mentioned, I, I'm an, initially an evolutionary biologist uh, by training. But by that time, I had be begun my switch to philosophy. I went back to graduate school and, and uh, got my PhD in philosophy. And so I thought, well, if there is an answer to any of these kinds of existential questions, surely that's going to come from philosophy. And so I started looking in a kind of a uh, more or less uh, systematic fashion. So I explored the number of philosophies of life, beginning with Buddhism, which was interesting, but it didn't really quite talk to me in, in, a, in an obvious way, possibly because of cultural differences or differences in language, whatever, whatever it was. And then I pretty quickly zoomed in on what is referred to as virtue ethics, which is a general approach to living your life that uh, goes back to the Greeks and Romans. But within that, there is a number of different kinds of virtue ethics. And so I was in the middle of exploring them when I saw a tweet of all things uh, that said, uh, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I thought, what the hell is Stoic Week? And why would anybody want to celebrate the Stoics? Considering that my impression of the Stoics at the time was based on the same misconceptions that most people have, that to be a Stoic means to be like Mr. Spock from Star Trek, right? So it's like suppressing emotions, stiff upper lip kind of thing. Turns out it, it is not actually like that. It, it, that is a, a misunderstanding. But I, I was curious I, I, and I thought, OK, Stoicism is a type of virtue ethics. And uh, uh, the Stoics that I read so far, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, were interesting. So why not? And that's how it got started. And here we are now, several years later. Uh, I, I am, in fact, a practicing Stoic. So this is a good thing for, for those in the audience listening that you can take it up later in life, you can apply it, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can apply it 
in two, in two ways, I guess. Uh, on the one hand, at a minimum level, Stoicism comes with a series of techniques. And those techniques are useful even to non-Stoics. In fact, they are so useful to non-Stoics that uh, those techniques form the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of the most successful modern evidence-based types of therapy. Now, if you go to uh, a cognitive behavioral therapist, that doesn't mean you're a Stoic. It just means that you think that some of the techniques that originated with Stoicism are helpful. Of course, at a deeper level, if you actually want to practice Stoicism, then then that becomes an all-encompassing philosophy of life. It becomes a way to establish priorities, to uh, to establish what is or is not important for you, how do you want to behave, what kind of human being you want to be. So I guess if we're going to you know, go into these techniques and applications and stuff, I think it's important to define um, what the Stoics mean when they say that we should live live our life according to nature. Um, because the, the nature part... Um, I had wrong, you know, until I read your book. So, <laughs> what what do they mean? <laughs> what do they mean? You know, it's not it's not trees and you know no, a, a vegan right. lifestyle no. necessarily. Although that's that could be part of it. There's nothing right? wrong with that, but it's not stoicism. <laughs> right. So, how how do we define nature then in this case? Yeah, you, you're right that the the phrase that we should live according to nature was actually a Stoic mantra, basically. Every every Stoic agreed with that principle. And you're also correct that it's easy to misunderstand. That there, is, there are at least two misunderstandings. One, the one you mentioned, that is, oh, so I should be an environmentalist, you know, eat vegan, hug trees and stuff like that. Uh, you... You probably should, arguably, but that's not going to make you a stoic. <laughs> <laughs> so that isn't what we're talking about. The other thing, the other misunderstanding is a little bit more dangerous because some people uh, understand the phrase live according to nature as meaning that whatever is natural is good and whatever is not natural is not good. That's clearly false. And the stoics knew that. That, in fact, is a logical fallacy, which is called the appeal to nature. It's obviously false that whatever is natural is is good, right? I mean, there are things like poisonous mushrooms, for instance, they're clearly not good for you, and yet they're perfectly nature, natural. Uh, there are other things uh, like, um, you know, books that are not natural, but I think they're pretty good for you, especially if it is a good book. Uh, it's a good thing for you. So so there is no equivalence there. There's no, there's no connection really necessarily between what is natural and what is good. So what then did the Stoics mean when they said that we should live according to nature? Well, they thought that if the point is to try to figure out what a good human life is like, which is, in fact, the point of philosophies of life, uh, then we should ask ourselves what sort of being humans are. That is, what kind of animals they are. Let me, let me put it to you as an example with, a, with, an, with an analogy. Suppose that I come to your place, you invited me over for dinner, and as a present, I bring you a cactus, a plant, right? So now you're responsible for the cactus. Now, now it's your cactus. Now, in order for, for you to make it so that the cactus can flourish, can live and have a happy cactus life, you have to know something about cacti, right? If you just know that they're plants, for instance, that's not enough because you might be mistaken and say, oh, it's a plant, so it needs a lot of water. And it doesn't. If you give a lot of water to the cactus, it's going to die. It's going to rot. Right? So cacti are not only a plant, but a particular type of plant. They're a desert plant. So they need little water and a lot of light. So that is what a good life for a cactus is. Analogously, the Stoics asked themselves, well, what is a good life for a human being? And they answered, whatever nature prescribed for human beings. Now, what is it in nature prescribed for us? Well, according to the Stoics, there are two characteristics, two things that really make us who we are, that make us different from any other species in, in, in the world. One is the fact that we're highly social. Of course, there are other social animals, but no animal on Earth has such a complex, structured societies as humanity, as human beings. And the other thing is that we are capable of reason. Now, other animals are intelligent as well, 
but none of them ca comes even close to the level of reasoning ability that human beings uh, have. So from that, the Stoics, from those two observations, the Stoic uh, therefore concluded that a good human life is a, is a life where you use reason to solve your problems and where you act in a pro-social manner. That is, you cooperate with other human beings so that everybody uh, has a good life. So to live according to nature means to use reason to solve problems and to live socially. So well, one of the things I found interesting was that this highly social part, it doesn't always mean sort of going out with friends or communicating with others. That can be, right, this, this social idea is that you can do things on your own that are in the good for, good for others, good for the world, and that is an example of being highly social. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, friendship is important for the Stoics. So and relations with your loved ones and all that, those those are part of what makes a human life meaningful. So they are important. But the main concern of the Stoic is to be helpful to what they call the human cosmopolis, the, the, the broad family of humanity, which includes not just your, your friends and your family, of course, uh, but literally everybody else on, on Earth, whether they live on the other side of the planet or not, doesn't matter. And the way you are helpful to the human cosmopolis is, among other things, by uh, being nice to people, by being, uh, you know, cooperative, by trying to do things together, by using your skills to make the world a better place, even though in fact, you might directly interact with relatively few people, right? You don't, you don't necessarily know people on the other side of the planet. But if you do your part uh, within your community, if you uh, are helpful as opposed to disruptive, if you are uh, creative as opposed to destructive, then you're doing your part. So you mentioned the stiff upper lip part and that, that sort of misconception earlier, right. which... which you know, I, I sort of came to this whole thing with a little bit. I mean, even the just the mention of the word stoic, we use it in ways to describe someone rather emotionless right. or whatnot. How do you um, how do you go about erasing that sort of stigmatism? What what and what actually how do stoics deal with their emotions? Are their emotions are they emotionally available? Are they vulnerable? Yeah. How yeah, that that, those are very good questions. So, um, and they are a little bit distinct, right? The stiff upper lip is somewhat separate from, separate from the emotion part, although there is a relationship there. So let's start with the stiff upper lip. Mm -hmm. It is a misconception, but just like a lot of other misconceptions, it is rooted in a little bit of, of truth, enough truth that uh, things can get confusing. So the stiff upper lip comes from the fact that endurance is, in fact, a stoic value. That is, when a stoic is faced with something that is inevitable, right? Uh, let's say my flight gets canceled. I get to the airport and my flight gets canceled. I can't do anything about that. It's not, it's not up to me. It's not under my control, right? Now I have two choices. I can throw a tantrum, get upset, you know, start yelling at people and all this sort of stuff. Or I can say all right, that's the way it is. I'm just going to take the next flight. Now, this, this, for the Stoic, the second is the right attitude. That is, you accept things that you cannot change and you focus immediately on the kinds of things that, in fact, are actionable. But from the outside, that might look like a stiff upper lip. Oh, he's not bothered by the fact that he missed the plane. Well, it's not that I'm not bothered. It, it's, it's that I try not to make it into a tragedy because it's not helpful. Right. This try, I try not to catastrophize things because it's not helpful. Uh, now, that's related, related, of course, to the issue of emotions. The misconception there is that Stoics try to suppress emotions, which is definitely not the case for the simple reason that it wouldn't work even if they tried. Uh, any psychologist would tell you that there is no way you can suppress your emotions. Uh, you're only only going to make things worse, actually. You're going to get frustrated and even more upset if you try to do that. However, the Stoics think that emotions always have a cognitive component. That is, there is a part of reasoning 
that is attached to your emotions. So let's say, for instance, that I'm on social media and I'm interacting with a number of people. And at some point, somebody started insulting me, right? So throwing insults at me. Now, if I get upset, right? And if I get, if I start yelling and I start, you know, responding uh, in a sort of obviously altered state of mind, you might ask me, so what happened? Why were you, why were you upset? And I can tell you a story. I can say things like, uh, well, the guy started insulting me. Insult, insults uh, are a bad thing and I don't deserve them. And also it was a public forum and I felt embarrassed, you know, all this kind of stuff. In other words, there is a cognitive component behind my emotions. There, is, there are reasons why I get upset. Well, the Stoics say, well, if that's the case, you can challenge those reasons, right? You can say, hold on a second. Uh, an insult is just somebody opening their mouth and, and putting some air out. It doesn't actually hurt me. It doesn't do anything to me. So why the hell am I getting upset? Um, in terms of embarrassment, you know, why am I embarrassed by these things? Uh, the person who is insulting me may be doing only one of two things. Either what he's saying is right, right? It might be hurtful, but it's right. In which case, actually, the, right, the reasonable thing to do would be to thank him for pointing that out and, and for allowing me to learn something. Or he's wrong, in which case the joke is on him. Uh, so why would I be embarrassed? Uh, either way, right? In one case, I can learn from the experience. In the other case, it's, it's its own damn fault and I don't care. So that process of reassessing and challenging your emotions is aimed not at suppressing them, but at redirecting them. So instead of getting upset and offended and embarrassed, uh, you can say, well, all right, let me let me see what I can learn from this situation. What is it that uh, I can do positive uh, that, uh, that it's actually going to be useful either for myself or, or for others. So, and that can be, again, uh, misunderstood as trying to suppress emotions as opposed to d having a dialogue with your emotions. So you, you touched on it a little bit just now about this real, what this book comes down to. And I think a lot of what the philosophy comes down to is this simple notion of controlling what you can control and letting go of what you can't control, right? Um, it sounds very simple on the surface, but even I was surprised at things that, that are really not in my control. <laughs> I think, could you unpack a few of those things for us? The main one I was surprised about was, and I guess it just would have required a little bit more thought on my side, but health, you know? Um, you make good choices about your health, you eat well, you exercise, et cetera. Right. But that's not, it's not something you can control, right? So what are, some, what are some other things? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So the, the basic stoic idea seems to be fairly trivial, right? That this is the notion that some things are up to me, other things are not up to me. And a good life, according to the stoic Epictetus, uh, is made of focusing on the things that are up to me because I can actually change them, and then accepting uh, with serenity, the things that I cannot change precisely because I cannot change them. So the fact that I'm going to get upset doesn't improve anything. Now, that seems pretty trivial until you, not, you begin to pay attention to what exactly Epictetus says is up to you and what is not up to you. Because as it turns out, according to, to the Stoics, what is up to us is very, very little. The only things that are truly, completely up to us, really, are our considered judgments and decisions to act and not to act. So if I arrive at a conclusion about a particular issue, that is my conclusion. It could be the re it might be the result of listening to other people's opinions and taking advice, etc. But ultimately, it's it's my opinion. If I say I believe X, that's my belief, not nobody else's belief. And then if I decide to act in one way or another, that's also my decision. Nobody nobody can force me to do it. It has to come internally. Outside of that, according to the Stoics, pretty much nothing else is in our control. The outcomes of our actions are not in our control because they depend in part on other people, on external circumstances, etc. So now you mentioned health, which is very counterintuitive because people say, but wait a minute, I can influence my, my health. Right? I can decide, for instance, to uh, 
uh, go to the gym and exercise regularly. I can decide to eat, to eat a healthy diet. I can decide to go to the doctor on a regular basis and, and practice preventive medicine. Yeah, that's all true. But notice that those are all judgments and decisions to act or not to act. That's what, that's what they are. So Epictetus would say, yeah, you're right. Those things are up to you. However, whether those things are actually going to work or not, if they're going to guarantee your health or not, that's not up to you. Because you can do everything right and then cross the street, a car hits you and you go end up at the hospital. Or in the middle of a pandemic, you can and should get vaccinated, use masks and all that sort of stuff. And yet viruses are, you know, pretty dangerous things. They can sneak in. Uh, even even under those circumstances, and you get sick anyway. So, of course, there is a connection, there is a relationship between your judgments and actions, on the one hand, and the outcomes, right? It's not that like they're disconnected. Uh, the more I go to the gym, the more I eat healthy, the more I go to the doctor, the more likely it is that I am going to live a long and healthy life. It's just not guaranteed. There is no guarantee, Right. And so for the Stoic, I need to focus on what is up to me, on deciding to go to the gym, the doctor, etc., and then accept from the get-go that sometimes things work out and sometimes they don't. And if they don't, you know, that's it. You've done your best. So what else What else you want? We're not children. We don't throw tantrum anymore uh, when things don't, don't go our way, right? We just accept them and move on if we can, uh, or if we try to find an alternative uh, if there is one. Sure. Well, I mean, I may, I still may throw a tantrum time to time, which is why I wanted to talk to you. Maybe you can help me. And you, you use um, an example in the book of uh, the, you know, the archer and the bow to get this point across, right? Yeah. Perfect aim, perfect technique. You let go of that, uh, uh, of the arrow, a gust of wind knocks it off course. What else can the archer do, right? Exactly. It's similar to golf, except I would argue yeah. there's much more variables in golf. There's, you know, it could be on the greens and, a leaf blows in your line or a, 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 a spike mark or something. There's lots that can, that are, that is not in your control within this game. So something right. I struggle with is, and, and this idea of um, what you call between the chosen and the desired um, within a goal, right? And so the instructions say to one should internalize the goal. You should choose a goal, internalize the goal, but you don't desire that right. outcome right the better i seem to play the more i seem to desire you know <laughs> that that score that really right. great score at the end of it and it makes things a lot harder for me and oftentimes um mm -hmm. it doesn't turn out very well mm -hmm. at the end right and so i can yeah. have that sort of free flowing that that i can choose to play freely at the beginning once i seem to attach myself to an outcome bad things happen. So right. I guess my question is, how does one choose a goal and internalize it, but at the same time, let go of the outcome and just play? That, that is the, obviously a very difficult thing. And it takes, you know, lifelong of commitment and, and exercise. It's not, you know, I, I've, I worked on this for many years and I am still occasionally slipping back into, you know, catch myself desire things that I shouldn't be desiring, according to Epictetus. But look, um, this isn't really that arcane. I mean, even, even in sports, we often do uh, admire uh, athletes who lose, for instance, but they gracefully accept the loss, right? So uh, we, we do admire people who we know they've done their best and we know they're good, and yet we understand also that a game is a game. You know, all sorts of other variables can come into play. And we actually admire those people that go there and shake their, their adversary's hands immediately, right? That they don't throw a, th a tantrum, uh, you know, a la Mac and Roe, to, to, uh, to use an example from tennis, from old fashioned tennis, right? What we'd like to see is the, what used to be called the gentlemanly and, uh, uh, way of doing things. You, you go on the other side of the, of, the, of the field and you shake hands with your opponents, thereby accepting your loss with equanimity, 
right? That is what uh, what the Stoics mean when they say you shouldn't be attached to the outcome. That is, what you should care about, what you should really be attached to, is your efforts. And that's because your efforts are up to you. The outcome, well, of course you prefer to win. There's no question about it. I mean, that's why the archer in the metaphor definitely wants to hit the target. It's not, a, it's not like he doesn't care about hitting the target. That is the whole point of archery, right? You want to hit the target. But he also comes into it from the start with the notion that if he has done his best and yet does not hit the target, it's okay. And it's okay because he has done his best. Uh, the world works the way the world works. It's not It's not up, up to us. So it's a matter of essentially, I mean, you mentioned initially at the beginning of this, this discussion, the notion that um, uh, golf, as well as a lot of other sports, are really a lot about mind, about, about self-control. Uh, for instance, there is research that shows that in yet another sport, boxing, the most effective, and, and martial arts actually in general, uh, the most effective fighters are the ones that keep their cool and manage at the same time to upset and therefore throw out of, off balance their opponent. Right? So if you tease your opponent and, you, and, and the guy gets upset, gets angry, and he starts swinging at you, he may be swinging with a lot of energy because he's upset, because he's angry, but also with very little precision precisely because he's, in fact, in the thralls of his emotions, right? If you stay cool, on the other hand, you avoid his, his blows much more easily, and then you wait for the opening, the, the moment when it's time to actually strike, and you're more successful. And there's pretty good empirical evidence that it actually works that way. So say we, say we do that, right? And say we give, say I give it my best effort um, and say... I fail, you know, the, the res well, failure in the context of I didn't reach that goal that I chose, right? Right. Um, what you're saying is I gave it my best effort. That's all I could do. What happens if, what happens if I succeed is, is, should I take pleasure in that? Um, is mm -hmm. there, is there joy? You know, if we're, wh what I'm hearing is, you don't go too low and you don't go too high, but where, right. how do we, how do we define success and failure through, through this philosophy? Yeah. Now that's a great question actually, because sto um, often stoicism is presented as the, the kind of philosophy that allows you to deal with loss and catastrophe and stuff like that. I mean, somebody famously once said that stoicism is a philosophy for people on an airplane that is going down. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> But it's not true. It's just as much a philosophy for people who are winning and, and who are actually, you know, achieving, achieving their goals. And I will invite you once again to think about what kind of sports figures we admire, right? So if somebody wins and then it starts gloating and making fun of their opponent and, and you know, just say, me, 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 that doesn't look good. It just doesn't, you know, it doesn't doesn't actually generate sympathy for that person or respect for that person. On the other hand, the person that wins and knows that they win. So it's it's OK to celebrate. I mean, it's human to celebrate a win. But you do it in a way that has that also implies magnanimity toward your opponent. That is right. Again, uh, the first thing you do, you shake your hands with with your opponent and you do not make fun of, of your opponent. You don't criticize. You don't say, oh, that schmuck lost and, you know, that sort of stuff. Then you're not only a winner in the, on the field, you are a winner in life, so to speak, right? Because you've shown maturity, essentially. And yes, I suppose at the end of the day, what the Stoics are saying is that we shouldn't, we should try not to experience wild fluctuations in, in emotional levels, neither too low nor too high. Now, some people might see that as a problem. I see that as being mature. It's like, you know, you're not a kid anymore. Um, you don't, just in the same way, way in which you don't throw a tantrum when things don't go your way because you're not a child, uh, you don't start, you know, jumping up and down and making fun of, of the others uh, when you win, again, because you're not a child. That doesn't mean that, uh, 
there isn't a degree of acceptance of, you know, sorry, of experiencing the, 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 the failure if you do fail or experiencing the joy if you do win. Of course you do. It's, it's, it's human. Uh, it's just a question of doing it with equanimity that is in right measure, right, without, without going overboard, essentially. Sure. And I want to, if I could, if I could just read something for your book that's sort sure. of on this topic, and then we can, and then we can move on because I think you've you've explained this very well. Um, and and this was about uh, Socrates uh, playing with the ball. Um, right. So so it says Socrates was like one playing at ball. What then was the ball that he played with? Life, imprisonment, exile, taking poison, being deprived of his wife, leaving his children orphans. These were the things he played with, but nonetheless, he played and tossed the ball with balance. So we ought to play the game, so to speak, with all possible care and skill, but treat the ball itself as indifferent. Right. What does that last, that last bit sort of mean to you? Treat the ball as it's indifferent. So in the metaphor, this is a metaphor that is proposed by Epictetus again. And in the metaphor, the, the ball is whatever life throws your way. Right in the case of Socrates, the things that you listed, you know, prison, losing their his his uh, wife and children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the the idea is that just like when you play ball, whether it is any kind of ball, soccer, football, baseball, golf, etc., the important thing is not the ball itself. The ball doesn't matter. It's just the instrument by which you do what you show your skills. Right. Of course, it's important to win, obviously, but we all agree that. A player who, I think at least we all agree, that a player or a team that plays very well is still deserve, deserving of credit, even if they actually lost, right? So long as they play well. In fact, if you win by chance, if you win by not playing well, you don't, you, don't, you know, people are not really that happy. <laughs> if you win just because you got lucky, um, people are not that happy because, which shows you that winning is, of course, the, the, the underlying goal, but it isn't necessarily even the most important thing. The most important thing is to play with skill, is to show that you know what you're doing, that you can handle the situation uh, well. So in the metaphor, the ball doesn't really matter because it could be a different colors, different shape, different, different weight. It doesn't matter. Made of different stuff. What matters is that you can play with it in a skillful fashion. In, uh, in the analogy, therefore, what life throws your way is not up to you. It's not that it doesn't matter. Of course it does. Uh, you, you know, if you end up in exile or, or, or you lose your family, that does matter. But it's presumably not up to you. This is the stuff that happens in life. And what really is important is that you handle it in the best possible way. Like, you know, we, we've all been, you know, literally the entire world has been through a pandemic uh, for the last, you know, almost three years at this point. And, you know, a pandemic is not something that any of us uh, caused or chose, right? We, we, I would have much better, you know, been much better off without, without it if it had been up to me. But once it comes in, uh, all, I have to, all I can do is to play ball in the best way possible, uh, which, of course, means different things for different people. Um, but what matters is, well, how well did I do? Uh, you know, did I manage despite the adversities? Did I manage to flourish, to do to do things despite the fact that there were outside external circumstances that were objectively difficult? The circumstances not up to me, but how I deal with the circumstances is. So I, I like what you said about getting lucky and, and winning um, because, it, you know, if we're, if we're taking this idea that um, success is really in our efforts, right? And doing the best we can do. Is there, um, is it not easy to trick ourselves into thinking we're doing our best? How do you know if you're really giving it uh, your best? Is that just something that comes with um, just a feeling that, you know, there seems to be, a, you know, a deep level of, um, introspection and 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 truth with yourself that's required to really practice this philosophy yeah. to the full to its full potential yeah no that's an excellent question uh so this that's why the stoics recommended a lot of self-analysis critical self-analysis but also a lot of cross-checking you're supposed to be interacting with other people 
who will keep you on your toes. Uh, if you read Epictetus, for instance, the Epictetus discourses, you see him interact with his students. And he tells them, it's like, you guys are not doing well. You're not, you're not doing what you should be doing. You, you're cutting yourself too much slack. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the I guess it was especially the first Rocky movie, but uh, mm -hmm. there is this character of, of Rocky's um, you know, trainer who is very much in your face. He, he, he tells it like it is, right? He, uh, and Rocky is kind of surprised by just how blunt his trainer is like, what, what do you mean? I'm doing my best. No, you're not doing your best. You could be doing much better, right? So the same goes with Stoicism. If you, if you listen to Epictetus, he sounds like, uh, like uh, you know, Rocky's uh, mentor and trainer. The notion is that we should be engaging in constant critical self-evaluation. Uh, that's, why, that's why one of the standard Stoic techniques is to uh, keep a philosophical diary. That is, before going to bed pretty much every night, you should spend five to ten minutes writing in your diary about some something that happened, something important that happened during the day, and you should be asking yourself three questions. What did I do wrong? What did I do right? What could I do better? Those questions are meant to help you analyze objectively your own behavior or as objectively as you can your own behavior and ask you ask yourself serious questions like you know how can i do better next time but that's not enough um, you also need cross-checking that's why stoicism is best practice in communities uh, you need help from friends from fellow practitioners from other people that are going to look uh, from a mentor if you're lucky enough that you can you you, you find one from people that look at you and say, hold on, uh, you're, you, you, you could be doing better. Epictetus at one point in the discourses says, you know, at some point you might need to sell your integrity, but if you do, sell it at the highest possible bid. In other words, <laughs> don't cut yourself too much slack because you do want to, to improve. But at the same time, you also have to realize and accept that we're all human and Therefore, we do make mistakes. We do slip up. And just because we make a mistake, that doesn't mean we're bad people. It's just, it just means that we're human. So cutting some, self, some, self, uh, uh, some slack to, to perform oneself is fine so long as you don't use that as an excuse to rationalize failure. Sure. So it's a very interesting, it's a very delicate balance, it seems. Right. The self-criticism, I did my best, you know, right. it's okay. Um, it, it, yeah, it's all, it, and I guess it's something it sounds like you never really quite master, much like the game of golf. It's, this is sort of an, an ongoing uh, pendulum, if you will. That's right. Um, I did have a question just really like on, on, on the application level of this and you personally. Um, when when bad things happen to you, you, you wrote a story about being pickpocketed um, yeah. in this. Uh, when things like that happen to you, um, me especially that that emotional system in the brain overrides the logical side yeah. very quickly for me and it and it takes a while to get back what sort of triggers do you use um that allow you to sort of return to the rational side uh fairly yeah. quickly that's a good question so first of all yes it is it is perfectly natural to be triggered and uh emotionally and therefore start going in the wrong direction what uh, stoic training allows you to do is to recognize the trigger, to recognize the fact that you are getting upset. And then there is a series of techniques that you can use to essentially calm down, to give yourself some time to calm down. If at all possible, once you recognize what Seneca, another stoic writer, uh, ma um, names the te terms the, the first movement of anger. So the, the side, you, you know, that, that kind of feeling that you have that you're getting angry because your adrenaline level is going up, right? Now, we all recognize that. Now, the, the Stoic tries to act on it, not in the sense of suppressing it, because that's actually counter, counterproductive. If you try to suppress that growing sense of anger, you're actually going to get even more angry because you're going to get frustrated by the fact that you cannot stop it. The trick there is to disengage as soon as you feel it. So, so disengage can take a number of, of uh, different formats. If you can, 
you just excuse yourself and go out for a walk. Right? If you can't go out for a walk, you excuse yourself and go to a restroom. Anything that, that, dis that disengages you from the current situation and then allows you a few seconds even, or ideally a few minutes to just calm down, engage in deep breathing, for instance, breathing from the, from the diaphragm, right? That one is well known to calm people down. Now, of course, once you calm down, the problem is still going to be there. <laughs> it's not like you solved the problem. But now your mind is at a different level. And hopefully you, you can, you're, able, you're better able to deal with it. Now, in my case, I try to do all of those things if possible. Either you know, go for a walk or uh, count to 20, uh, deep breathing, you know, go to a restaurant, whatever it is that, that may be feasible on the moment. But I also have a, a mantra that is directly inspired by Epictetus. You know, first thing, when something looks like it's going wrong, I force myself to repeat internally if there are other people. And if not, if I'm on, on my own in, in a full voice saying, OK, what is up to me here and what is not up to me? Remember, some things are up to me. Other things are not up to me. Another thing that I do is I literally ask myself, OK, what would Epictetus do under these conditions? Right. How? What would the, Epictetus is one of my role models. Is is my reference point. Is is pretty cool kind of guy, and so I ask myself, okay, so if if he were here, what would what would that how what would that look like? How would he do? And those things help. Now sometimes, again, we're human, so sometimes even that doesn't help, and you you lose it and you get more upset than you meant to. That is the time where later on. When the whole crisis is over, you go back to your diary and ask yourself, so how come that I got so upset about this thing? You know, how how can I do better the next time around? So if you can prevent it by disengaging with the situation temporarily or by using a mantra or by engaging in some kind of, uh, of you know, respiration, you know, breathing activity, do it. If it fails, then make a note of it. And then later on in the day, go back and try to figure out what exactly happened and why you were so upset. You know, I think it's listening to you talk. I think it's really ironic you found stoicism through Twitter, which is generally <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, an infuriating place. I find, yes. um, and and so I can imagine these techniques that you're talking about being applied. You know, at least if someone is getting into this, new to this, many, many times a day, especially if they're online, yeah. if they're working in a busy city, if they're working in a stressful work environment. Um, do you do you believe that this this philosophy um, can withstand the sort of constant onslaught of, you know, signals and and insult hurling and, and just kind of everything that comes with everything we're being fed in, in the 21st century, I yeah. guess. Well, it's, there is a reason why stoicism is getting so popular. I think it, it is certainly an antidote to that kind of situation that you're talking about. Now, the Stoics in general, not, not, they don't just say, okay, here's how you deal with the situation. They also have a different kind of advice, Epictetus especially, and that is avoid some the situations, the difficult situations, if you can. So uh, I, for instance, took uh, like nine months off of social media uh, until recently. I just came back over the last few weeks uh, because I, I noticed that, you know, this was just getting me upset um, all the time. And it's like, why, why do I want to spend so much energy and, uh, you know, emotional uh, uh, investment into these things that are actually not that important? Now, I came back for a number of reasons. For one thing, because... I have friends and family all over the world, and they kept complaining about the fact that they didn't hear enough uh, from me, et cetera, et cetera. And also because I do believe that I can actually do something positive on uh, using that, 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 that kind of media. You know, you, you have an audience, so you can help. I mean, after all, that's how people like you find me usually. <laughs> and um, so, so you can do something good. But I am back with guidelines in my mind about limiting uh, the number of uh, minutes that I spend during a day doing these kind of things. I am much more focused about, about other stuff. So 
one of the things that Epictetus says is that the easy way, the easiest by far way to avoid a problem is simply to avoid temptation. Mm. If you if you can move yourself away from uh, from a potential problem, then that's the best thing to do. But if you cannot, then your frame of mind helps, right? If you actually have convinced yourself that, let's say, insults are nothing to you, as Epictetus says, because they don't actually hurt you, well, that gives you quite a bit of an advantage on social media uh, because you become, you know, impermeable to that kind of things that, you know, now these days when people go into the insult mode, I simply block them immediately. I have no compulsion at this point blocking people because they were just wasting my time. And more importantly, they're lowering the level of discourse. What I want on my social media is a is a good level of discourse where interactions are positive, constructive, useful for people. I'm just not interested in in people who want to bring it down. And as, therefore, as soon as I I notice that somebody's trying to do that, uh, the block the blocking uh, button is is very convenient. It's very easy to use. And you know, I used to have compulsion. I I used to have a little bit of a uh, refrain in, in using it. I said, "Oh, come on, that's rude." You know, I don't want to block people. Now I said, "Nope, sorry, you violated the rules. That's it. You're out. One strike, you're out. You don't get three strikes." I don't have enough time for three strikes. Yeah, but even you have said, I believe you said, correct me if I'm wrong, that that. <clears throat> Stoicism needs an update. Yes. Well, how would it, you go about doing that? Well, I, that's one of the things that I tried, for instance, in uh, one of the books you you mentioned, the Field Guide to a Happy Life. And I'm actually in the in the process of writing a new book uh, that focuses on the philosophy of Cicero, uh, the ancient Roman philosopher and statesman, who was not quite a Stoic, but he was very sympathetic to Stoicism, and yet he was critical. Uh, as, uh, at the same time. And, you know, look, Stoicism requires an update, needs an update because it was it's a philosophy that uh, um, was articulated 2,300 years ago. And things some things have changed uh, in the meantime, right? I mean, human human nature has not changed. One of the one of the reasons, you know, I still think that the Greeks and the Romans have still today a lot of good things to say to us, a lot of useful things to say to us is because even though the technology and the science, of course, have advanced enormously, human nature hasn't changed that much. We are pretty much the same kind of people that we were two millennia ago. Uh, we have the same wants and needs and fears and hopes and joys and stuff like that. Nevertheless, there are some things that have changed. For instance, the Stoics, the ancient Stoics, uh, believed in providence. They believed that the universe is an intelligent living organism that does its own thing and and that we are literally bits and pieces of this living organism like if it, if we were cells in my body right so each one of us is a cell in the in the cosmic body well that's a very nice thought because one of the things that it allows you to do is to say look even if something bad happens to me like a cell dying in my on my skin that's actually good for the universe it's good for the cosmos which means that i can not only accept it but embrace it and you know be happy even when apparently something goes wrong because it's for the greater good of the universe well that's a very nice thought too bad that as a scientist living in the 21st century i don't believe that the universe is a living organism i think there is no reason uh, or evidence to believe that that is the case. I mean, the universe is neither benevolent nor malevolent. It's just neutral. It doesn't care. You know, there's not. There's nothing. There's nobody out there who actually gives a crap about us. Uh, we are on our own. So, if that's the case, then I can no longer uh, love my fate, as the Stoics would say. I can endure it, right? I can still try to act with equanimity. I can still trying to say, look, I, all I can do is to do my best. And then if things don't go well, then I'll have to accept the outcome. But no, I don't have to go as far as Epictetus and say that I should be happy or or at least not disturbed, let's say, if my uh, loved ones die. There is a, there's a uh, very famous bit in the uh, discourses where he says, uh, remember to kiss your wife and your child goodnight. And then, uh, you know, if they die, you will not be disturbed. Now, people read that 
passage out of context and immediately think, what kind of a psychopath was this guy that, you know, he's not going to be disturbed if his wife and, and child die. But we had to understand the context in which he was talking. First of all, the historical context. At that time, it was actually very common for people to die, even when they were uh, young and apparently healthy. So you did, you did need to be prepared for that kind of, of uh, situation happening. But also, Epictetus really did believe in a providential universe. So he thought, you know, if my wife is going to die tonight, that's for the best of the universe. And therefore, who am I to complain about the fact that, you know, the universe is, going, is, is, doing, is doing well? Uh, today, I don't have that luxury. So if my wife should die uh, tonight, I would definitely be upset. But at the same time, I would practice an updated version of Stoicism and remind myself that death is a normal and inevitable part of human life, that I need to be prepared for both my own death and the death of my loved ones and deal with it in the best way I can. Uh, so it's still very helpful, but it's not quite the same as the ancient version of Stoicism. So the, you mentioned, so the, w the way I sort of, my first introduction to this, to Stoicism was kind of the way all 20-somethings that, you know, fancy themselves as fake uh, intellectuals <laughs> come across it, which is reading um, uh, Meditations, uh, Marcus right. Aurelius. Of course. And I, I'm still taken aback, and I think anybody that reads that book is of how relevant um, the insights that were written centuries ago can be today. And you mentioned that human nature has not really changed um, all that much. Uh, are you someone that believes that there is, um, in the future, there is a better way to, to mm. maybe live our lives or conduct our lives? Um, or, is, or is everything that we feel and experience now, has this all been, been done before? Well, so y yes and no, uh, meaning that we certainly have made progress, even in terms of in moral terms, let's say, or in ethical terms, from the time of Marcus Aurelius. For instance, the obvious one being, thankfully, there is no slavery these days, right? Uh, the Roman and Greek societies and Egyptian society and Persian society, basically pretty much every large uh, society at the time was based on slavery. Uh, today, although we have certainly forms of oppression still in place, unfortunately, actual slavery is pretty rare, uh, comparatively speaking. Uh, right. So, so there has been progress. And, and uh, so I do believe that human beings have the ability to build a better world, but not dramatically so. Uh, we still, you know, there's no slavery, yes, but there is a lot of oppression. War is still with, very much with us, as, as we know. Uh, there is fewer, even there we've made some progress because there's certainly fewer wars of conquest than there were in the ancient world. In the ancient world, it was perfectly normal and acceptable to say, hey, I need to go and pillage the other, the other guy because I need to make a living. That was an acceptable way of making a living. Today, at least we don't do that. We, we try to come up with excuses for why we invade other countries. We don't go there and then say, hey, you know, let me get just grab their stuff because I'm, I'm, I'm stronger. So we have made progress. And yet at the same time, we have not eliminated any of the major uh, you know, problems that, that uh, humanity has dealt with. So to some extent, things are better. But to a large extent, we still deal with the same basic issues and more importantly we we deal with the same basic human psychology as i said before we we still have the same you know joys and experience the same jo joys and pains we have the same desires and fears uh, including for instance first and foremost the fear of dying uh, and so on and that is why these ancient philosophies are useful look if um you can see behind me on my left there there is aristotle and if Aristotle were suddenly to join this conversation, right, uh, via what are we using, Riverside, today, that would be a big get for me. That would yeah, that would be a that sure. would be a really yeah. big thing, right? I'd be, I'd be <laughs> impressed. Now, be, imagine what would happen, however. So Aristotle, the, the his first reaction, presumably, would be like, "Wow, look at the technology you guys have! You you can actually talk to each other thousands of miles." away without being in, in the presence of each other. It's like, wow, his, his mind would be completely blown by that sort of stuff. But then he would settle down 
and he would start listening to what we're talking about. And he would say, oh, yeah, I, I recognize that. You guys are talking about human failure. You're talking about friendship. You're talking about self-improvement. You're talking about dealing with setbacks. Yeah, I know. I know all that stuff. I, I wrote the book about all that stuff, right? So that's, that's why I think uh, not just the ancient Greco-Romans, but also other cultures. I mean, why is it that there are so many people today who still consider themselves Buddhists? for instance, or Confucians or Taoists. Those are all philosophies that arose at about the same time, a couple of hundred years before uh, Stoicism. And yet they're still very valuable today, um, precisely because the basic uh, parameters have not changed. The details have changed, but not the basic parameters. Right. So like this chosen verse, desired example, yeah. you know, the Buddhist, Buddhist will phrase it some other way. A, a, yeah. a, you know, a therapist might say that's you know, mastery versus performance and that's Absolutely. anxiety and all this stuff. So Absolutely. which is which is very cool to to go through the process and and discover. Um, another question before we get a, get you out of here. Um, the Stoics are great for a lot of things. I think mostly, though, their uh, their one liners are yeah. I mean, the pithy one liners are, you know, really hard to beat. Um, do you have one that uh, you stick with often, or maybe even one that um, us people who continually torture themselves through the game of golf might find <laughs> find useful? Well, the the one that I that I use regularly as a mantra is the one that I already mentioned. Some things are up to me, other things are not up to me, and I need to focus on the first and develop an attitude of acceptance for the second. However, there is another one from Marcus Aurelius that often comes to my mind and that I, I used frequently. And that is a bit in the meditations where he says, uh, the cucumber is bitter. Okay, don't eat it. Why do you have to go on and complain about the fact that there are bitter cucumbers in the world? <laughs> right. So this to me is str struck me as very, very true and very helpful. That is, look, of course, some things are not going to go your way in life. And if you can avoid the consequence of those things, if you can avoid those things entirely, great. Turn right and you know, go, go some other direction. Don't eat the cucumber. You're not forced to eat the cucumber. But there is no point in then going on and complaining about how things in general are as if somehow the universe itself were going, was going after you. The universe doesn't care. Uh, it, it is what it is, and it is up to you. Your your role is to deal with the situation that that is presented to you in the best possible way. So this notion of bitter and I, by the way, I love cucumbers. Actually, I don't find cucumbers right. bitter at all. For the best, but uh, yeah, um, but but I do know people who actually have it altered, uh, you know, uh, different from normal uh, sense of taste for for whom the. The cucumbers really are bitter. So probably Marcus was one of those. He, he probably had a hypersensitivity to cucumbers. But it's a, it's a great phrase because it reminds you uh, of the fact that it's better to deal with problems rather than to complain about it. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, well, I do not anticipate being uh, able to avoid the temptation of playing golf again. So <laughs> instead, we will... What disengage, breathe, and what was the third thing? Oh, count to twenty. Whatever, whatever helps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the good news for golfers, Massimo, is that disengage is built into the sport. You got to walk right. to your ball. Next one. So if we just breathe and try to redirect um, some of our emotions, and hey, you have a you have a, a built-in excuse. It's not my fault if if exactly. you don't hit a good shot. Right. I did my best that I could do. Um, I appreciate you spending some time. I look forward to your next book. I look forward to updates on stoicism and maybe uh, when Aristotle discovers TikTok or something, I would love to know how, how, how that I'll let you out. know. Thanks yeah, for having me. Thanks. It was a lot of, a lot of fun. <laughs>